Hello, everyone. I am Sushmita Roy, and I'm from University of Wisconsin, Madison. Can everyone hear me at the back? No? So I should yell a little bit. OK. So uh, like other speakers in uh, this meeting, I also changed the title of my talk. But I am going to talk about network inference. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about some of the computational methods that we have developed in my group. Uh, uh, and um, if time permits, maybe we can talk a little bit about the developmental lineages. But uh, towards the end, I'll talk about the evolutionary lineages aspect. So. Um, I want to start off at a very high level of what I mean by a regulatory network. And this might be really basic for many of you. But I just want to make sure that we are talking about the same thing. So what is a regulatory network or a transcriptional regulatory network? Uh, it's a network that describes uh, connections between transcription factor proteins to target genes. And these networks specify uh, uh, downstream gene expression levels, context-specific gene expression levels. And these are really important because of uh, uh, their relevance in uh, disease and also in evolution, because changes in gene regulation can have severe or not very severe consequences. So what uh, uh, we try to depict these uh, as directed graphs. So, uh, so re network inference is really trying to figure out the uh, one aspect of the problem is trying to figure out the, uh, this kind of a wiring diagram between regulators and target genes. Now, this is a hard problem, especially in mammalian systems, because regulation of gene expression happens at multiple levels. Uh, perhaps the most well understood uh, level of uh, regulation uh, is at the transcription factor level, where transcription factors bind to promoters of genes. In mammalian systems, uh, it's becoming increasingly common to observe these long-range regulatory interactions. And whether a transcription factor binds to a particular region of the uh, genome depends on the chromatin environment. This is something that Bill and Yanjun talked about. And also, there are other networks, like signaling networks, that can uh, interact with the regulatory network, a transcriptional network, to uh, control the output gene expression level, which makes this problem uh, complicated. So um, the majority of my talk, I'll focus on this question of trying to infer what the regulators of, uh, of a gene uh, are. So uh, there have been a lot of approaches, experimental as well as computational approaches, to try to infer regulatory networks. Experimentally, people have used chip-chip uh, or chip-seq experiments where you can measure genome-wide where a transcription factor binds. One can also knock down a transcription factor and measure genome-wide mRNA levels and infer uh, um, a, a target based on uh, significant changes in gene expression. More recently, people have used attack seq or DNAs1 accessibility assays. And if you have a collection of PWMs, one can try to infer the regulators, uh, the targets of a particular um, um, where a transcription factor binds based on these assays. Computationally, uh, there have been supervised learning methods as well as unsupervised learning methods. Supervised learning methods are basically using um, and a, a set of training examples, train a classifier, and then around the classifier and other pairs of regulators and targets. Uh, the methods that we've uh, worked on, uh, along with many others, are in the realm of unsupervised network inference. And these methods are largely making use of gene expression data, large matrices of gene expression data, to infer gene regulatory networks. And of course, the challenges with experimental assays are uh, they are uh, very expensive, but they give you good, uh, uh, they, are, they are very accurate. Computational methods tend to be uh, less expensive, but they uh, tend to have a lot of high false positives. So, uh, so I just wanted to, uh, I don't know how many people know about the Dream Consortium or um, uh, this particular challenge. So the Dream Consortium is basically uh, a group of people, they put out a lot of different challenges. And this was uh, in 2011, where they did a challenge uh, of uh, uh, assessing different network inference algorithms using gene expression data. And what, so what you're seeing here uh, are metrics, uh, which they call uh, the area under the precision recall curve. And this is how these are different methods for network inference. and. Um, what, uh, what they observed was, uh, so this is for simulated data, this is for E. coli, and what they observed was that uh, in simulated data and in E. coli, we do a reasonably good job of performing uh, better than random, which is here. However, in yeast, 
our performance is really bad. So, uh, so this is a really hard problem, and this was uh, something that uh, we've been very interested in in trying to figure out what. Is there something that we can do uh, beyond expression to improve the quality of the networks that we are inferring? So what can we do? Well, we can try to develop better algorithms. What are these algorithms? These algorithms are uh, ones that can leverage, that can go beyond gene expression data and try to uh, use auxiliary types of data sets that are informative of a regulatory relationship between a transcription factor and a target gene. Uh, so trying to put constraints on the structure that we are trying to learn. And the other thing is to try to go back and look at the data and the, the results that we are getting and see if there is something that we can learn about why some or what we can, uh, what, what we are uh, able to predict versus what we are not able to predict. So before we get into the algorithm, so I'm going to uh, just uh, say a little bit about what do we want a model of regulation or a regulatory network to capture. So here's a very simple cartoon of a particular gene that is under the control of these two transcription factors. So when these two proteins bind to the DNA, this gene is on. When it is off, the gene is off. So this is a very simple model of regulation. And in order to be able to capture this, we want to have two things. One is the structure of the model, that is who regulates whom. Uh, and the logic as to how these two regulators regulate the expression of this gene. And so in this case, it's like an AND logic. And people have tried to model these regulatory networks using different, uh, uh, different uh, mathematical models, using Boolean networks, differential equations, as well as uh, probabilistic graphical models. And the ones that we'll be talking about fall under this uh, category. So we've seen probabilistic graphical models. Uh, we've seen a nice introductions to the, uh, those models. I'll just describe them in the context of gene regulatory networks. And so here, uh, we represent uh, our, uh, each a gene or a regulator is represented as a random variable. And uh, in the ideal case, we want to be able to estimate these joint distributions over all of these random variables. But uh, we uh, often approximate it with a set of uh, products over uh, uh, individual variables uh, using different conditional distributions. And so the PGMs are nice uh, models for regulatory networks because, uh, like I said, uh, we have a structure and a function, and that naturally maps on to the graph structure and the, uh, the probability distribution, the conditional distributions that we want to be able to estimate. So people have been using PGMs for uh, uh, a lot of problems in genomics, and especially in regulatory network, uh, in the regulatory network field. Uh, these methods have evolved in trying to look at different uh, types of problems. Uh, so they, it started off with uh, Friedman and uh, Collar and Aviv Regev uh, working with just gene expression matrices and applying Bayesian networks to infer these networks, uh, regulatory networks, and then uh, people have uh, uh, gone in different directions and methods have been developed to look at dynamics, learning multiple networks, integrating different types of data. Uh, so uh, one of the, the so the uh, the thing that we'll be focusing on uh, in today's uh, uh, talk will be trying to incorporate priors in the graph structure to incorporate uh, constraints in, in the in the graphs that we are learning. So there are uh, two broad uh, classes of methods, uh, structure prior and parameter prior based methods. Parameter prior based methods are methods that put priors on the parameters. And structure priors uh, have been used to uh, put priors on the graph structure. And they have been largely used for learning Bayesian networks, whereas these have been used for uh, largely um, methods called dependency networks, which are really inferring the graph structure by solving a set of local uh, regression problems. Um, so we fall under the realm of structure prior. And we developed uh, a method called Merlin P, which is based on trying to, uh, so the motivation of this method is to try to integrate, go beyond gene expression, integrate other types of data, to, and put uh, a prior on the graph structure, and use the prior to try to integrate these different types of data. So it's based on another algorithm that we developed uh, a few years ago that's uh, called Merlin. And so just a few, a couple of slides on Merlin. So if you think about all of the network inference algorithms that are 
are there. Expression-based network inference algorithms. In the literature, we can pu put them into two main categories. One is uh, these methods called per gene methods. Well, essentially, what these methods are doing is they're taking a, a variable and estimating its regulators or estimating its neighbors. Um, and then uh, there are these module-based methods, which are grouping genes into modules, uh, groups of genes that have similar expression patterns, and then learning regulators for individual modules. So the advantage of per gene methods is that they are more precise, assuming they can get the network structure right. And module-based met methods, the advantage is that they're more interpretable because they are uh, summarizing the information. And you only have to reason at the level of modules. But the, uh, the issue is that we, uh, uh, we may sometimes want to know what the re re regulatory program of an individual gene is, and the module may be an approximation. So we developed an approach that tries to uh, learn a per gene model, but uh, we like the module aspect, but not a, a hard constraint, but rather a more soft constraint to be able to uh, somehow uh, put a prior such that regulators that are, uh, or genes that are in the same regulatory module have similar uh, regulators, but not identical. Yeah. How big are these modules? Sorry? How big are these modules? Uh, they vary. So between five to uh, a few uh, hundred like a couple of thousand genes. So it depends on the data. OK. So all right, so that was Merlin, which was basically trying to combine per gene, per module methods. What we've done now is trying to extend it to try to incorporate other types of information. So how do we do this? Uh, so we work within a um, Bayesian framework. So the idea here is that the thing that we want to infer, G, is a, is a random variable, and we would like to be able to estimate the, the posterior distribution of the graph given the data, which by Bayes' rule can be written like this, which you've already seen uh, an intro to uh, before. So all of the uh, machinery, all of the, the um, um, data integration that we're going to do is going to happen uh, by, uh, at this, uh, with this term. So, so the question is, how do we write this? So we're going to make some independence assumptions. We're going to assume, so the graph is a collection of pairs of uh, variables, each representing the status of an edge, whether an edge is present or absent. And we're going to make an independence assumption. Uh, it's a strong assumption, but it's an assumption that uh, uh, a lot of people make. Uh, it is an interesting research question to try to relax this assumption. Um, so, so basically, we'll write this as a set of edges that are present in the graph, edges that are not present. And so now what we need to do is just specify this function. And this we write as a logistic function. And uh, logistic, so this uh, idea is something that people have also used in the, in the field before. Um, so the idea is that. Uh, um, so we're going to write the prior probability of an edge to be parameterized by uh, different features and, uh, and a, a bias term, which will basically, which can be used to control um, the cost of an edge. So in general, networks uh, that are uh, that are inferred from data tend to be sparse, and so one can tune this parameter to uh, provide just a, a cost on the edge. And uh, so, so basically, this is where we'll be integrating different types of data. Um, so for example, in the case of regulatory networks, uh, the different types of uh, prior information that one can use is uh, presence of uh, motif binding, or transcription factor, knockout assays, or transcription factor chip assays, and so on. And they can be incorporated as different terms in the, uh, the prior. So, so that's uh, how we specify P of G. And then the Morin algorithm is actually very similar to, uh, if some of you know about the module network algorithm, I'm sure Suin knows about it. Uh, so, uh, so like you have gene expression data, and then uh, the idea is you start with an initial set of modules, initial set of candidate, uh, a set of candidate regulators, and then we iteratively repeat between these two steps where in one part of the iteration we are um, revising what the regulators are for a particular gene, given the current module membership. And then in the next step, we are relearning the modules. And we keep doing this until we are done. 
The other thing that we do is we do this within a stability selection framework, which is something that we've seen and others have also seen is really important in terms of in improving the quality of the networks that we get. So the idea is that you take your expression matrix, you just uh, subsample uh, from the data, and then you infer different networks, and then you get a confidence on each, each of these edges. So, uh, so we... Um, so we have this algorithm, and then we uh, looked at it, uh, how well we do in, in yeast. So in yeast, uh, what is nice is that you have different types of data sets. You have already, like from the same source, you have um, a large compendia of gene expression data sets. And so we use these different types of data sets to uh, ask whether we can do a reasonable job of inferring a network where uh, our gold standard is uh, uh, derived from chip uh, chip-chip experiments that were filtered based on uh, evolution, uh, evolutionary conservation. So what you're seeing here is a precision recall curve. So, um, uh, so basically, we are dialing down the confidence of an edge, and then we are measuring precision and recall. And there are really two sets of curves over here. Uh, these, are, these are methods that are using the prior, and these are methods that are not using the prior. And we see that. Uh, when we incorporate priors, we are able to do much better than methods that are not using priors. So incorporating priors is uh, very beneficial. And we uh, see this uh, behavior across different gold standards. So we had, so, uh, so this gold standard was the MacIsa gold standard. Uh, and uh, we have other gold standards as well, uh, which uh, are not as good as Mackay's gold standard, but still it's what we have. And we look at different data sets, and we see that the methods that are incorporating priors are generally better in terms of their precision AUPRs compared to methods that are not incorporating priors. So adding priors is a good idea. So that was looking at the structure. But we also want to ask whether the graphs that we're inferring are doing a good job of predicting expression. So for that, we get a graph structure, and we fit a linear model. And then we ask, in a holdout set that we didn't use to uh, learn the network uh, structure, how well, is the, uh, uh, how well are the regulators predicting expression? And uh, by well, it, it should be much better than what you would get from a random set of regulators. So we are controlling for the degree of a, of a gene. And what you see here is the proportion of uh, uh, proportion of target genes that, are able, that we are able to predict significantly better than a random case, a random situation. And what is uh, interesting to observe, oops, sorry, interesting to observe uh, is that uh, here, expression-based methods are actually doing a reasonable job, in fact, better than uh, methods that are actually using priors, although the methods that are using priors are also not bad. So uh, there is a little bit of a trade-off. So if you only care about predictive, predicting expression, maybe just use expression to learn whatever model that you are interested in, but if you're interested to look at maybe uh, the mechanism of how things happen and getting the structure. So getting the structure is really uh, important over there. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're doing there, but the, is it the case that you're using the inferred network structure somehow to help you in your building your predictive model of gene expression? Yes. So then couldn't you can compare to using true? Because the, the no, you have some gold standard that you're compared against in your in recall for if you, if you give it the true uh, network, how well does, it, does that do, let's say? Uh, we don't have the true network. So how do you compute your precision recall? Oh, oh, so that's the gold standard. Uh, what do you mean by oh, I see, I see, I see. Oh, where is the gold standard? Uh, yeah, I don't have the gold standard over here, but it is not very good, actually. But is it is it better than all of those? No, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think it is uh, very good, but I have to. Well, go. Sort of weird, right? well, so the gold standard may not be perfect. I mean, that's always a gotcha, right? Sure. So, so this is where the uh, the prior is, um, uh, and then um, yeah, I don't know where the gold standard is over here. So why are the priors making things worse? Sorry. So why are the priors making things worse? Do you have some idea? Um, I don't. Uh, 
Uh, OK. So, uh, so, what, um, so the other thing that we can do is look at uh, um, what might be helping. Uh, what, is there something about the data that we can think about uh, that can uh, inform us about the network inference performance? So we can ask, uh, ask this question in EAST, because in EAST you have, uh, uh, you have these nice compendia of gene expression data sets. And so all of these expression data sets are really um, looking at some kind of a perturbation to the network. And there are three different types of perturbations, large-scale perturbation that people have looked at. Uh, so this is the same data set for the different uh, um, uh, for, for, uh, for the different AUPRs that I showed you. So there is natural variation, there is stress response, and there's a gene knockout. And these are different perturbations that people often do to measure genome scale gene expression levels. And we looked at how the different uh, uh, methods actually perform under those different um, uh, data sets. And what we see is that the methods that are, the networks that we get on natural variation tend to be better or at least as good as other kinds of data sets. So we think that natural variation is a more useful type of perturbation that we can make. Uh, and these types of data may, may be more informative for inferring a gene regulatory network than uh, if you were to use something, uh, if you were to use some other kind of data set. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. Are you, are you uh, learning a different network for the perturbed data? Uh, so all the data sets are perturbed, and we are learning a different network using each of these different data sets. And then we are asking how well are we able to recover the structure that is there in our Go standard. Are the data sets different sizes? <laughs> they are more or less of the same size, but the size doesn't matter. We controlled for that. So we basically subsample the data, and it doesn't seem to matter. In fact, the natural variation was slightly smaller, I think. What's the level of imbalance in the data? What do you mean by imbalance? Like positive, negative. You have AUPRs. Oh, right. Yeah. So uh, there are a lot of uh, possible edges that, there, that can be there. It's a very unbalanced data set. So because regulatory networks tend to be very sparse. So we don't use ROCs. We use precision recall curves to assess performance. Sure. I mean, but it looks like the AUPRs are pretty low. Yes, you're right. So like, yeah. Also, um... Yes, the performance is not that great. So that's the thing with regulatory network inference. I mean, the the performance of these methods is really, really low. And you know, it's it's all it's the best that we can do right now. And uh, there are so there are multiple uh, reasons why. So that's one of the things that we want to try to figure out why we are not able to perform well. It may be that you know, so the gold standards are based on chip, and we are using gene expression to infer a network, and this is probably how well we can go, how well we can do. It also may be that the um, there was something else that I wanted to say. Um, The gold standard itself may not be perfect because they are based on chip, and you know one would want to be able to. Uh, these are like large scale gold standards, and so it's there's another issue with how good they are. Um, but but still, it's the best that we have in the field for uh, yeast, and so we uh, so we asked, uh, is are there a subset of transcription factors that we can recover based on expression? And we see that uh, there are about 50 some transcription factors for which the targets that we infer based on expression have a significant overlap with what you get based on uh, uh, in in the gold standard. But there are a lot of transcription factors, so there were. Uh, in the gold standard, there were about 100, uh, 104 transcription factors. So for about 50% of the transcription factors, we really are not able to infer the regulatory network based on gene expression data alone, uh, even when we incorporate these priors. So this is a, a thought question. I don't know what the answer to this is. And uh, we've looked at one of these questions. We've uh, well, one, one obvious thing is mRNA is a, bad, uh, indic is a bad proxy for the actual activity level of a transcription factor. And so people have started to look at ways to try to infer, treat the mRNA level, uh, treat the transcription factor activity like as a hidden variable and try to infer that. And, it, uh, 
And that has some promise in terms of improving the network, uh, uh, the quality of the networks that we are uh, learning. Uh, they may just, the, the gene is just not changing at the mRNA level. Uh, the gold standards may not be perfect, but we can, there, there may be many reasons why we are not able to predict. Uh, but one thing that we did notice was that when we try to look at for a set of target genes, uh, what the regulators are, and compare it to the regulators that we are predicting based on expression, they tend to be in the same pathway. So we are at least getting relevant regulators, but we may not be getting the exact regulator. Now the question, so this was all in yeast. So we'd really like to be able to answer this question in mammalian systems. In mammalian systems, it's even harder because we don't have nice compendia of gene expression data sets. Uh, and so uh, here we become data parasites. So we've been basically using gene expression omnibus uh, and collecting data for specific systems that we are interested in, that our collaborators are interested in, and these are basically the embryonic stem cell. This is also an, uh, another reason why we are looking at the embryonic stem cell is because at le among all the cell lines that are there in human, this is one of the cell lines where people have tried to map a gene regulator network uh, using different types of data sets. So people have looked at the network multiple times. So there is some hope that the, the gold standard is likely reasonable. And we've collected it from the literature, and uh, we are also collecting other data sets. Uh, and uh, this is uh, being revised right now. And so we have a reasonably large compendium of gene expression data set that we fed, in, uh, fed uh, to Merlin using a prior, and then we get a network out. And um, what you're seeing here are precision recall curves, again, for the GM cell line and for the mouse ES cell line. And here also, priors are beneficial uh, than not using priors. Uh, so that concludes the first part of the talk. So yeah. When you see, so that there not enough human data. Have you looked at GTEx data? I haven't looked at GTEx. We have 20,000. Right, yeah, so I, I should look at GTEx. Uh, it's a huge resource. Yeah, um, so the thing is that we want to infer a cell type specific network. So we want to say this is the network for embryonic stem cells. This is the network for uh, this cell type and so on. So with GTEx, you have a lot of tissues and uh, and uh, like you know, for each tissue, we could infer a gene regulator network. And I know there are like these multi multitask network learning methods that can be used. So that's something that we re would we really should do, especially because we see that genetic variation may be a nice, uh, maybe a very useful type of data set uh, to infer gene regulator networks. So yeah, we'll do that. Okay. All right, so I'm going to go to the second part of my talk, which is trying to look at network changes. And this is, um, uh, one can think about how regulatory networks change uh, across time or across evolution. So the one that I'm going to be talking about is how uh, uh, regulatory networks can uh, change across evolution. Or basically, how can we learn networks that uh, across multiple species? So why uh, are we or the community is interested in this question? It's because uh, it's uh, well known that changes in gene regulation can be an important contributor to phenotypic diversity. And people have been trying to, uh, uh, to map changes in regulation and how that can um, try to understand what changes in regulation might be associated with changes in uh, phenotype. Uh, but to get to regulation, we need to measure uh, functional data. We can look at sequence, but we also, uh, uh, it would be great to also look at uh, functional data. And so people have been collecting things like uh, genome scale mRNA levels, chromatin state, protein, pro protein uh, proteomic uh, measurements, and so on. And the hope is to try to use these data to infer uh, regulatory networks for individual species and then try to compare at the network level what might be changes uh, the, and then try to associate them with changes in the uh, different phenotypes. Of course, this is a hard problem, but we want to start somewhere. And uh, as is the case with other, uh, within one species, mRNA is again the most widely uh, uh, available data set. So what we have are a set of species and we have genome scale mRNA levels. And what we'd like to be able to do is use these data across multiple species and say something about uh, uh, changes in regulation. 
So we've developed methods to uh, look at um, data across multiple species. One method, which I won't talk about, looks at uh, groups of genes across multiple species or modules. And uh, uh, it, uh, it uses the phylogenetic information, both at the species level as well as at the gene tree level, to try to identify groups of genes that are uh, similarly behaving in different species. What I'll talk about is uh, a new method that we developed, which is uh, called MORTAL, which is uh, supposed to uh, take gene expression data and sequence specific motifs and infer a network for each species. Yeah. For the sequence motifs, are you using just the promoters or the end the long range Just promoters. <laughs> and this is all in yeast. So we are coming back to yeast. We don't have the data in mammals across multiple species. At least I don't know of it. There is a recent paper from uh, uh, on CD4 pieces that uh, sample that has the across chimps and humans. I see. That covers uh, multiple species and chromatin uh, uh, chip seed data. Like, I'm pretty sure it's like one of K2718. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. But many samples? OK, so that might be an interesting data set to look at, yeah. Uh, so, what, so what this algorithm is, we have uh, a species tree, and we also have gene trees, and uh, we have some sequence-specific motifs associated with each of these different species. And uh, what uh, we want to be able to do is infer a network for each of these different species. So typically, we don't actually have species-specific motifs. So, so the way we got this was actually using a resource that was produced in uh, Aviv Regev's group, where they had an algorithm to try to identify motifs uh, across different species by starting with the source species and using evolutionary filtering to, uh, and relearning the motifs in individual species. So that's what we are going to use. So just a few key properties. Uh, uh, it is basically trying to work under the assumption that uh, regulatory networks of closely related species are likely similar. And can we use that information to try to infer uh, perhaps better regulatory networks? So here is the problem. So we have these three data sets. And we want to be able to infer these three networks. And again, we write this uh, in this way. So we have three. We want to be able to uh, estimate these three graphs given data, which we write like this, the, the data likelihood and the prior over the three graphs. Now this, we are going to decompose into individual P of D i given G, because you're going to assume that once we know the graph, we don't need to know anything about the other graph. Uh, so this can be uh, computed easily. Now the question is, how do we work with this? And this is where we are incorporating the phylogenetic information. So, uh, so the way we work with that is, uh, so we're going to again introduce indicator variables that uh, uh, encode the status of an edge, whether it's present or absent for each species in the phylogeny. So we have three species. So we have, uh, for each edge, this is what we're going to do. And then we are going to assume that the graph, the three graphs, are going to be written as a set of uh, binary vectors. Uh, and so we are making a, a, the independence assertion, again, at, at the level of edges, but we are uh, not making any independence for the different species. So the same, uh, so. So does that make sense? So that's so basically that's what we are doing. Okay? So the question is how do we now compute this? Um, so this uh, so the way we do this is we are going to introduce some more uh, internal variables. Uh, so this is equivalent to what we had uh, in the previous slide. And the reason why I'm writing it like this is because now I'm going to use something called the Felschenstein algorithm, which is a well-known algorithm with phylogenetic trees that have been used to compute the uh, probability of a set of characters, observation that the leaf node given a phylogenetic tree. And so that enables us to write down the, uh, the, the joint over those binary variables in a much more tractable way. And so all we need to do is then just specify these conditional distributions. This you can specify to be something. These are parameters in our, um, our we, these are hyperparameters. We don't uh, estimate them. Uh, we 
take them as input, and uh, we uh, write this as a continuous time Markov, Markov process where we have a rate matrix, which uh, also takes in a branch length. And so for every branch, we can actually have a different uh, conditional probability um, of gain and loss. So that's basically what it is. And then the, the learning itself is really uh, a greedy search where we are searching over the space of different graphs simultaneously. But when we add an edge, the, the score of the edge is also taking into account how much it is uh, affecting the prior. So we first looked at simulations. And so we generated uh, different networks that were uh, that, uh, b based on our uh, prior. And then we uh, generated expression data sets using GNET Weaver, which is a simulator for expression data sets. And then we inferred networks. And then we tried to compare these. And what we see here is that in a simulation method, the method in red is a method that uh, uses uh, the phylogenetic prior versus method that doesn't use a phylogenetic prior. And we see that there is an advantage. This is uh, obvious because we used a phylogenetic prior to generate the simulated networks. But it's uh, nice to see this is a, uh, um, that the simulation is uh, able to demonstrate the advantage of a method that is using a phylogenetic prior. And uh, we applied this for, to real data. And so this was in uh, yeast uh, phylogeny, where we had data from uh, different uh, species uh, measuring their expression levels under different stress responses. And uh, what we, uh, so to assess, again, uh, the problem is that we don't have a lot of ground truth. But we do have some ground truth for the uh, yeast cerevisiae. And what we see here is the red line is higher than the blue line. And so it shows that there is some advantage in inferring a regulatory network that is uh, uh, learned based on phylogenetic information. For some of these species, for some transcription factors, we also have some chip data. It's not perfect, but there also we see that there is an advantage uh, that you are able to recover the targets better than if you were not using a phylogenetic prior. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we compared how similar the networks that we are getting if we were to use uh, a phylogenetic prior versus not. And what we see is that uh, if you didn't use a phylogenetic prior, you tend to get very uh, dissimilar networks. So trying to make any statements about conservation or divergence becomes really difficult because it uh, tends to find networks that are so different. Whereas if you use mortal, you are able to get something that looks more reasonable. And also you have this uh, trend where you see that networks that are different are more dis uh, far apart in the phylogeny are more, more different in, their, uh, in the structure. All right. So that concludes the second part of my talk. And uh, yeah. Sorry if I missed this, but how did the indicator variables deal with the directionality of the edge? Uh, so we uh, established edges from transcription factors to target genes. So, so we always do it that way. But if there is a TF and a target, um, if that, if for, for, for TF TF relationships, we'll have. Uh, two variables over there. And if you had the edges going both ways, can the graphical model? So these are dependency networks. So we, uh, oh, yeah, it's not a Bayesian network. So it can, it can handle that, yeah. There are some other issues that we are not really computing data likelihood. We are computing pseudo likelihood because it's just more tractable to work with that. Uh, so, but yeah. Those are some other issues with, yeah. All right, so yeah, go ahead. Did you infer network from uh, correlation of genes between cell types? Uh, did you try to infer network from correlation of uh, genes along for the genetic tree? Along what? Correlation Sorry? of genes along for the genetic tree. Cardinated changes in expression. Um, so like evolutionary uh, expression of genes. So we infer, um, I see. So you're saying you have a, 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 a gene and its expression profile across species. Yes. And then you are. Uh, and you compare that, yeah, yeah, yeah compare, you look for genes that, uh, that have correlated expression among species. Yeah, so the arboretum algorithm basically does that. 
So we learn groups of genes that have similar patterns of expression, and we group them. Uh, but you get a module, and then you know we have to infer uh, a regulatory relationship based on something else. And so, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, so the model method is basically trying to use phylogenetic information to infer gene regulatory networks, and we see that there's some advantage uh, over here. Uh, one of the issues is that we need some uh, su sufficient number of samples, and so they are not ready to be applied yet for many most phylogenies. Uh, but um, for that, we would be working with methods like Arboretum, which are trying to basically identify modules across different species if you don't have a lot of samples. All right, so in the last part of the talk, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the development, since we have time, uh, the developmental uh, aspect of uh, regulatory networks or looking at uh, regulatory networks on a developmental lineage. And in particular, I'll talk about uh, the role of chromatin state. And um, so through, and so this is something that, again, you've heard about in other talks in this meeting. Um, so many labs, along with the roadmap project, are now systematically collecting chromatin marks across multiple cell types. And um, one of the things that is of interest to us is that when the cell types are related by a tree or by time, uh, so can we, say, can, we, can we use this information to say something about the underlying process that uh, uh, we are studying? So. Um, so in order to do that, I'll uh, describe some uh, a little bit of notation, and this is similar to what Chrome HMM does. So the idea is, so suppose I have a genomic locus. Uh, the, I'm going to say a chromatin state is basically the combination of chromatin modifications associated with that genomic locus. And then I'm going to define something called modules, chromatin modules, which are groups of genomic loci that have similar chromatin uh, Profiles. So here is one, uh, two modules within a cell type where you have uh, four uh, loci in each module. And what we would like to do is, given a cell lineage structure and uh, multiple chromatin marks measured in each of these different cell types, we would like to be able to measure. Uh, we would like to be able to. Uh, uh, systematically identify what are the different modules in each of the cell types and also ask the question how these modules change. Yes? Should I think of modules as being adjacent, uh, being adjacent to my slide or can be in different parts of the genome? In this case, they can be di in different parts of the genome. Yeah. Um, so we just look at like chunks of uh, genomic regions and then work with that. OK, so here, the way we are uh, working with this is uh, we have, so we're going to assume that the chromatin state is a hidden variable that we don't observe, and the chromatin profile is uh, something that we observe, and we would like to be able to infer that from the data. And there is uh, a, an ancestral cell, and there are these derived cells, and we, uh, there is a, 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 a probabilistic process by which the modules uh, or the state changes across uh, between uh, uh, along these branches, and then uh, at each of these cell types, depending upon what the module is, you have a particular pattern. So this is really a clustering problem, but it's a clustering problem for each cell type. It's a uh, you have three clustering problems over here, and we want to solve the three clustering problems simultaneously. So the way we do this is for each cell type, we are going to represent these modules as, uh, uh, as a component of a, a Gaussian mixture. So we have a multivariate Gaussian mixture model where each component, each uh, dimension of the Gaussian is one of the chromatin marks. And then we have these transition probabilities that uh, capture how the chromatin states are changing across these different, uh, across uh, two cell types. And we can estimate this using expectation maximization. OK. Uh, K, the number of modules, is something that you have to specify. So we haven't figured out a nice way to automatically learn K, but that would be a nice thing to be able to do. Um, 
All right, so we've applied this in uh, two different contexts. I'll talk about one context, which is with a collaborator, Rupa Sridharan, who is studying cellular reprogramming. And what she's doing is she's basically taking a, a, these uh, transcription factors or expressing them in differentiated cells called MEFs and then getting out uh, induced pluripotent cells. And what uh, the one of the challenges with the reprogramming field is that it's very inefficient. And so people have been trying to make this process more efficient by uh, doing different things. So uh, one of the things that uh, would be interesting to know is if there are underlying uh, genes that are regulators that are uh, bottlenecks that could be perturbed to make the reprogramming process more efficient. So we have, uh, this is array data. So that's why it is OK to, uh, it is, um, so basically, we are looking at just promoter-specific uh, expression, uh, not expression. We are looking at chromatin marks. So we have these different activating marks and repressive marks. And we also have mRNA levels. And we'd like to be able to uh, identify what are the different chromatin modules in each of these different cell types and what genes change across these different cell types. Um, and so what you're seeing here are a bunch of heat maps. Each row corresponds to uh, a cell type, and each uh, column corresponds to a module. Now, the modules are actually matched across the different cell types, and that's what the joint learning of the modules gives you. So we know this is module 0. So module 0 in one cell type is the same as module 0 in the other cell type. And uh, so there are 15 modules, and these modules have different patterns of chromatin signatures. We have a set of modules that have a repressive uh, marks, modules that have activating marks, and so on. And we've uh, compared these modules. and. So we want to know whether the genes, so if you see, look at the heat map, in general, it looks like the, the size of the modules are generally the same, but the genes may not be the same. And so we compared the module membership across the different uh, pairs of uh, cell types. And along the diagonal are how similar are the modules that have the same uh, pattern, whereas uh, along the off-diagonal are modules that have different patterns. And we see that there are uh, not a lot of off-diagonal elements, but there are some that are happening between uh, modules of the same pattern versus modules of different patterns. Uh, but what this gives you is a discretization of the data, which is much more easy to interpret rather than the uh, the original uh, continuous signals. So this is for a particular gene that is known to be an important player in establishing the embryonic stem cell state. And what you see here are the modules that we infer. So in MEF, it is in a very repressive module and goes to a very active module. And also, we see that in the, the data, uh, they have all of these activating marks. So what you can do is you can use these uh, uh, as signatures and look for additional genes that might be important uh, potentially important for uh, understanding or making reprogramming uh, efficient. So that's just to conclude the third part of my talk. And basically, I've talked about uh, different ways to look at regulatory networks in ev evolutionary as well as developmental lineages. In the developmental situation, we are primarily looking at chromatin modules across different species. But we are interested to bring back other uh, the regulatory network by inferring these uh, cell type specific networks. Um, and uh, with that, I just want to thank my lab. Um, and uh, I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you.